Good morning. This is Lucas Coffier from the EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation. I'm the project manager of the EU Japan Technology Transfer Help Desk. Good morning for all those that are following us in Europe and good afternoon for those that like me are here in Tokyo or Japan. Um, I would like to start the day uh, by giving you some information about the, the help desk, how to reach us, how to register to the newsletter, and then introduce uh, today's speakers uh, to the audience. So as you can see from this slide, uh, this is the email to the email address to uh, to reach me if you want to send me a comment or ask for information about the help desk you also uh, can find the url of the website of the help desk where you can find additional documents webinars uh, past webinars other videos uh, podcasts and of course the database with available technologies that we uh, collect from universities and research centers from europe and japan you will also see the URL of the survey uh, for SMEs that we are running constantly to know what are they looking for uh, and how we can better serve their interests. And then finally, you will see the last line with the URL of our newsletter. We publish quarterly a newsletter with all the latest news about the help desk and what we do. So if you're interested, please do register and we will be happy to uh, keep you posted. Today we have two speakers uh, with us uh, talking about data protection in Japan in a post-GDPR world. Uh, we have Ulrich Hirkov and Erich Urui from uh, the, their Tokyo office. And uh, before giving the floor to our speakers, I would like to introduce them by uh, providing you uh, a short bio. So Ulrich uh, studied law at Freie Universität Berlin in Germany and uh, at the HSG St. Gallen in Switzerland. After the completion of the first state examination, he gained his first insight into business in Asia with a business internship in Seoul, Korea, followed by the attendance of an LLM master program at Boston University School of Law in the US to focus on international law. During the mandatory legal training period, uh, Mr. Kirchhoff continued his focus on international uh, aspects of the law, including training stints at law firms in Germany and the US and the Fair Trade Commission in Berlin. Mr. Kirchhoff is admitted to practice law in the state of New York and in Germany. Since 2006, Mr. Kirchhoff is working in Tokyo at Archie's Foreign Law Office, Foreign Law Joint Enterprise with TMI Associates, and is registered as a foreign registered lawyer in Japan since 2009. Mr. Kirchhoff has accompanied a large number of European investors in Japan in commercial, corporate, and data related cross border transactions in various industries, such as the automobile, machinery, medical, healthcare, food, and fashion. Having advised European businesses in Japan for more than 10 years, Mr. Kirchhoff gained a global insight into different legal concepts and cultural factors affecting business operations of European companies in Japan. Uh, the other speaker is Eri Furui. Uh, after having been awarded a Master of Arts in Economics, she passed the bar examination in 2003 and was admitted to the Japanese bar in 2005. She advised on various corporate matters to both domestic and international firms for five years at TMI Associates. And after five years of their experience at TMI, she was seconded to a prominent search engine company and advise on litigation and legal issues relating to the company's internet advertising business and data privacy. She was also involved with discussions about legislative development of data privacy with councils and officers from various firms and governments. From 2012 to 2013, Mrs. Furui attended an LLM master program at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law and studied American law, including laws related to web services. After her graduation in 2013, she moved to Singapore and worked as a foreign legal advisor. In 2014, she returned to DMI in Tokyo and has regularly advised European businesses on cross-border related transactions concerning various fields of the law in Japan, including on the personal information protection law and law against misleading representations. Without further ado, and hopefully I provided you with a, a picture about our uh, the speakers and speakers' knowledge, I would give the floor to uh, the first of our speakers today, which uh, I think is going to be Mr. Kirchhoff. Uh, Ulrich, the, the floor is yours.
Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, Luca, thank you very much for this uh, very kind uh, introduction. We are very delighted um, to give a short overview about um, uh, data protection in Japan in a post-GDPR world today. And let me give you a short overview of what uh, we want to, to cover in the next uh, good half an hour or so. Um, we want to uh, speak a little bit about uh, the Japanese Data Protection Act and its application here in Japan. We want to cover uh, data processing, what is that, um, what are the requirements. We want to look into uh, compliance obligations and uh, last but not least, we also of course want to cover what are legal consequences in Japan in case of data breaches and violations. So let's get started. The first question that is typically asked is what is the, the applicable law when it comes uh, to, to data protection um, in Japan? And Japan uh, basically has uh, one uh, law on data protection. It's called the Act on Protection of Personal Information or APPI as it's uh, usually called in the market. And uh, of course it applies to um, uh, operators of a business um, uh, in Japan, but also extraterritorial in cases, um, for example, businesses that are outside um, Japan collect information uh, from um, data subjects that are located in Japan um, to whom basically services and goods uh, are offered. This uh, regulation is uh, very similar uh, to regulation we see in, in the GDPR um, and has basically been implemented in Japan um, already last year uh, on May uh, 30th, 2017, um, in fact, before the uh, GDPR became effective. And if you look into um, the EU, uh, on, the, on the other hand, there we have, um, of course, the general data protection regulation that directly uh, applies uh, to all member states in, in the EU since uh, 25th of May 2018 this year. And uh, of course there are certain uh, national laws still uh, in place in the member states that basically reflect uh, what is in the GDPR with certain exceptions. Now, when does the Japanese Data Protection uh, Act, the APPI, applies? Um, as already mentioned, it applies basically to, to any uh, yeah, business uh, arrangement that handles uh, personal information for the use in its business. If uh, I refer to business, then it does not have to be a legal entity. It can be also a single entrepreneur that is using personal information uh, in his business for marketing purposes, uh, for example. Um, uh, automatically, if you collect one set of personal information for your business, the APPI will uh, be applicable. That's relatively new because um, until the amendment that was became effective last year um, in, in May 2017, there was a threshold requirement um, uh, basically resulting um, in, in the fact that not to all, especially smaller businesses, this Data Protection Act was applicable. So it was basically extended in its application. Um, that led to um, the situation that many businesses did not um, or were not prepared for the uh, new act and had to implement and still have to implement measures um, to comply with that, such as implementing uh, a privacy policy in order to inform the data subject at the time of collection of the personal information uh, about uh, the purpose for the use of this personal information. So what constitutes personal information under the APPI? Um, the definition of personal information is fairly similar um, compared to the GDPR. Essentially, um, any information that can identify an individual constitutes personal information. So this is rather broad and means that also numbers, for example, um, that put together with other means uh, lead to the identification of 
a, an individual uh, constitute personal information. For this reason, um, we will see that uh, in a second, um, information such as um, email addresses, IP addresses, uh, also uh, typically constitute personal information. Again, similar to the uh, regulations in the EU, the APPI um, introduces, with the last uh, amendment, um, the category of sensitive personal information. Sensitive personal information um, is any information that basically might lead to a discrimination of the person based on such um, information, such as uh, medical history, criminal record, race, social status, um, certain beliefs, uh, etc. Um, what is interesting to note is that um, in context of the current uh, negotiations uh, on the uh, acceptance of an or adoption of an adequacy between Japan and uh, the EU, uh, Japan will actually introduce uh, guidelines that will further uh, broaden the definition of sensitive personal information because the um, view in the GDPR in the European Union on what constitutes sensitive personal information is a little broader than the definition in the APPI that concerns in particular um, information on sexual orientation and on the membership in labor unions which will be included in the guidelines and in the future uh, apply to information that is sent from the EU uh, to Japan on uh, individuals. What is also uh, important to note that uh, with regard to sensitive personal information, a stricter legal standard applies. Um, if a, a business um, wishes to utilize and collect and use such information, um, the express consent for handling or processing this uh, sensitive information is required. The next slide shows um, an overview of what, in principle, constitutes um, personal information. And as I mentioned, it can be anything, any number, uh, for example, numeric code that uh, could lead to the identification of an individual. Um, that's the reason why, for example, IP addresses, GPS location information, uh, fingerprint, DNA information, etc., are all covered uh, in principle by the APPI, um, which extends the application of the APPI in particular to many uh, newer technical uh, applications that are coming into the market also in time. Now let's talk about the so-called purpose of use. The purpose of use is rather unique to the uh, Japanese data protection environment um, because the purpose of use is the basis for processing personal information. You may know from the uh, UGDPR environment that any processing of uh, personal information requires a certain basis, a justification to process the information in the EU. Uh, we know, for example, um, in order to fulfill the requirements for a particular contract that is concluded, we know consent, of course, we know, um, which is relatively new, the legitimate interest um, in order to process information. We know that under certain circumstances there may be um, legal requirements in order to process um, personal information. In Japan, the main basis is basically um, the purpose of use. And the purpose of use um, has to fulfill certain criteria. Basically, uh, what needs uh, to be done is that at the time of collecting personal information, the data subject has to be uh, informed uh, about what the purpose of use of the collected information will be. And this information has to be given to the data subject right at the time of the collection or immediately 
uh, thereafter. The purpose of use does not um, constitute a consent or any other additional justification. So basically in Japan you can process um, personal information within the purpose of use with, without obtaining consent of the data subject. As long as you have informed the purpose of use to the data subject and you keep within this purpose. It is not possible to change um, the um, purpose you, you once mentioned later unless you of course inform the data subject of the new purpose um, and only thereafter use the collected information within the new purpose. Uh, uh, Rick, of, Rick, can you hear me? It is not yes. And if the original purpose of use is exceeded, then for this access part, a particular a new additional um, justification has to be obtained, which is in Japan typically the content. The next slide shows a sample purpose of use. We have taken this um, from basically a public website. In this case, it's an airline, as, as you can see. And um, just to give you an impression what it typically in includes, you can see here, of course, in case of an uh, uh, airline, um, the, the airline wishes to have the uh, or use the personal information uh, for the ticketing process, for example, for the check-in, uh, etc. But as you can also see here from, from this relatively long uh, purpose of use, for example, um, in case of number seven, uh, the information can also be used for um, the development of new services and products. And uh, as is written in point number, uh, number nine, also for the uh, notification to the uh, data subject of services and products offered by the airline. So basically for marketing purposes. This is all covered here in the purpose of use and as long as this purpose of use has been notified uh, at the time uh, of the collection of the personal information, the personal information can be used for all those um, matters listed up here. Uh, now the speaker has changed. Uh, my name is Eli Fui. I'm a lawyer from Japan. Um, I'm delighted to speak uh, today. Uh, now, um, in this section, I would like to explain uh, about data processing of um, uh, with data transfer from Japan um, inside Japan. Um, any transfer of personal information to third parties requires in principle, the consent of the data subject, unless an ex exception applies. Um, this sample uh, is uh, the case where uh, data is collected within Japan by company A, and this information is transferred to company B in Japan. So uh, how should we obtain the consent in this case? Um, under the APPI, no specific um, rules are provided uh, to, uh, with regard to the way of obtaining the consent. But we recommend to obtain um, this uh, consent in writing for evidence. For example, you can just uh, create a box in the terms of, con terms of conditions and let the user to check the box. And um, with regard to the exceptions to uh, the requirement of obtaining the consent are uh, the following, uh, the, the last two uh, arrow heads. Um, for example, first, if transfer is required for life or safety of an individual or required by laws or ordinances, um, the consent is not required. Um, this is a common sense, rather. Uh, and the second one is um, the transfer data is anonymous. 
And the third one is um, when the third party is outsourced service providers. And um, there are some um, exceptions to the parties which does not fall under the terms of the third parties. Uh, one is that outsourced service providers, and the second one is, tax, is the um, succeeding legal entities uh, due to mergers or call spillage, uh, company spillage or uh, business transfer. And the third one is the joint users. And in addition to these um, consent requirements, um, the company, like the recipient of the company, the recipient of the personal information, like this company B, is required to check the identity of company A and how this personal information is obtained. So let's move to the next. Um, here's a sample of ANA group case. Um, we uh, took it from a public source. Um, this is not related to our, our uh, practice, but uh, this is a good example. Um, this is a sample of disclosing required information when personal information is shared with joint users. As mentioned in the previous slide, um, sharing with joint users does not require the consent of the uh, data subject. Um, let's look through uh, what kind of information are required for um, dealing with data transfer. Uh, first, um, we need to disclose which party uh, will be shared as, a joint, as joint users. In this example, ANA holding, Holdings Incorporated and Air Japan Company Limited, Anna Wings Company Limited, and Anna Sales Company Limited are listed as uh, such parties. Um, this example um, also um, provides for the purpose of use by the user. And this is required uh, for uh, sharing with joint users. And the third one is a personal information items to be shared. And the fourth one is the party responsible for management of personal information. Uh, when you look at this sample, uh, probably you uh, are interested in um, which, uh, what, what kind of company um, these uh, companies are. Um, Anna Holdings Incorporated includes All Nippon Airways Company Limited, which is a, a famous uh, air flight company. And the second one is um, the company which provides uh, clues and cabin attendance to the flights. The third one is the company, uh, which is an affiliate of uh, ANA, uh, Company Limited, and as a, a tra travel agent. And when you look into the purpose of use, the purpose of use, use by each user is very in detailed. So actually, uh, the purpose of use must be in very specific as this one. And this all possible uh, things, uh, possible way of use uh, by this uh, each company. And also, please look at uh, the party responsible for management of personal information, uh, which is the last in the last row. Um, this means um, we need to disclose which party will be responsible for security of data. Uh, and receiving uh, complaints from customers and response, um, responding to data subjects requests. For example, the data subjects can uh, request for disclosing information uh, concerning um, their personal information. And they can also request for collection of incorrect uh, personal data and um, suspension of use in some case. I uh, will explain it later, uh, but here we need to um, specifically provide who among these uh, joint users are responsible for um, this, ki this kind of role. Next, uh, I'd like to explain the case of transfer of personal information from Japan to EU member states. Um, this is the case uh, where 
um, information is collected in Japan and such personal information is transferred to EU member states. Uh, for example, probably uh, in your company, uh, you collect customer data in Japan and transfer it to EU member states. Or maybe you have a um, subsidiary in Japan and headquarter in EU member state, and EU headquarter uh, manages uh, employees' matter, and you may collect local employees' data in Japan and transfer to uh, headquarter. This is the such case. Uh, we, uh, when we transfer personal data from Japan to EU, uh, we need to uh, think about it in two steps. Uh, one is um, to transfer to a third party. That uh, EU member state is a third party. So we need to um, consider the requirements for transferring to a third party. And the second step is, um, addict, um, is the requirement for transferring to a foreign, con foreign country. Um, the requirement for transferring to a third party is, uh, has been already explained in the previous section, but um, when you transfer personal data to a foreign company, you need to uh, fulfill uh, other requirements. Um, first, um, you need to um, fulfill adequacy requirement or a consent or a contractual agreement. Um, for for, uh, for adequacy, require, adequacy requirement, um, the P, uh, Personal Information uh, Protection Commission needs to um, accept uh, and design it the country which um, satisfies the adequacy. And now um, Japan is considering and um, moving for accepting EU member states as the country uh, for, for which fulfills adequacy. Um, this is the status of the discussions between EU and Japan. Um, now, the EU and Japan successfully concluded their talks on reciprocal adequacy concerning each other's level of data protection on 17th July 2018, and the EU Commission launched the adoption of its adequacy decision on 5th of September 2018, and it is expected to be adopted sometime in the last quarter of 2018, and in parallel, Japan will finalize the adequacy finding on the slide, the, the slide. And now, uh, Japan has published the uh, guidelines concerning the transfers between EU and Japan and called the complementary rules on personal data from EU by reciprocal adequacy. Um, this, is to be in, this is to be enforced when the adequacy decision is enacted. And we are now ready to go on this uh, adequacy uh, decision, and we are now waiting for the final step. Yeah, just a short uh, comment from, from my side on, on, on the next slide. As uh, we all know that the GDPR um, is applicable now, uh, what should not be forgotten is that uh, the GDPR may also directly apply to entities that are located in Japan um, under certain circumstances. Um, basically, the GDPR defines those circumstances. There are three um, possible cases. Either um, the Japanese uh, entity processes uh, data here in Japan in context of an establishment uh, of a controller or processor in the EU, um, offers um, goods or services to individuals in the EU without having any uh, establishment uh, in the EU or um, the data processing of an entity in Japan relates to the monitoring of the behavior of individuals in the EU such as uh, profiling or using the data uh, from EU data subjects uh, pro for profiling. So basically in, in today's data um, protection environment also Japanese uh, entities uh, businesses using processing data always have to um, check to what extent not only the Japanese APPI but also 
um, the GDPR may apply to them. Now in this slide, uh, let me explain the uh, right of data subject granted, granted under APPI. Um, there are two types of uh, rights in general. Uh, one is the request of disclosure of stored personal information. And the second one is the correction or deletion of incorrect personal information. Um, with respect to disclosure of stored personal information, um, the, the, per, the, the personal data subject uh, can request for disclosing name of, this, name of the business handling the personal information and the purpose of use and procedure of gaining access to or collection of and suspension of the personal information and the contact information for complaints concerning handling of personal information and also the charges for, uh, require, for making requests for expenses of disclosure. And um, for the purpose of use, uh, if this is obvious, actually um, the data processor does not need to uh, disclose it even though uh, it is requested. Also, there are some uh, exceptions uh, for this requirement. Um, the data processor may refuse uh, with giving a notice to the person who requested um, this disclosure. Um, the, the first exclusion is um, when the possibility, when it is possible uh, that their business is seriously interfered. And the second exclusion is that if that request is against the law. Next, uh, I would like to explain uh, about the request of correction or deletion of incorrect personal information. Um, this request can be ma only made if the personal information is incorrect. And these are the general uh, requirement, uh, the general requests which uh, data subject, subject can make. Um, but if they find out that the purpose of use or um, the purpose of use uh, by this company is exceeding the purpose of use they were notified or when uh, the personal, info, personal information is transferred without prior consent, the personal um, data subject can um, request for suspension of use or deletion of personal information. And further stepping up, if um, the companies uh, refuse, uh, they, they, they have a right to sue after two weeks if uh, the company um, refused. Uh, however, uh, for the suspension, suspension of use or deletion, um, the company may refuse with giving notice to uh, the data subject if that request requires too much cost. And it is difficult to um, respond to this um, request. And the company can prepare alternative ways to protect the personal information. So uh, here the takeout is um, the data processor should establish the structures, processes, and responsibilities to deal with requests of data subjects in order to react in time. So uh, next, I would like to explain the compliance, the, the, the compliance obligations under APPI. The data subject is required to um, prepare the systematic physical and technical data security control, supervision of employees, and supervision of service providers. For systematic, physical, and technical data security control, uh, for example, the data uh, processor should design it a person who protects and controls personal information, such as chief privacy officers, 
However, it is not mandatory under the law, but it, it, it is recommended. And it is important to make it clear who is responsible for which data. Also, the data processor should maintain records of access to stored personal information and limit the access by passcode or maybe physically. If the information is um, massive and important, probably you should protect uh, the data in a um, locked room or locked media. For supervision of employees, you should uh, increase awareness and knowledge of employees by providing periodic education and training regarding personal information. And also, the, the data, tab, data processor should set up the organ and report line for suspension or reporting request in case of incident. And also, it is important to provide um, that the employees must not disclose personal information to a third party outside the country, outside the company, in employees' handbook. And also, um, we usually uh, recommend uh, the, the data processor to have its employees sign the NDA non-disclosure agreement when hiring the employee. For supervision of service providers. Actually, this is very important because in many incidents in the past, uh, service providers leaked personal uh, information to third parties and the uh, com companies which um, entrusted services uh, took, also took responsibility. For supervising service providers, uh, we recommend to conclude agreement on handling personal information or include such provisions in distribution agreement. And in such uh, contracts, um, you should have service providers undertake not to use this personal information exceeding the purpose of service. And also, um, you should provide for the system to audit these uh, service providers. And the personal information is recommended to be distracted in short periods or after the use of the use according to the purpose of service providing. Uh, here's the consequences in case of violation. Um, when it is necessary, a personal Information Protection Commission may enter the premises to investigate. And after they investigate, they can um, make administrative order to submit report. Or they can uh, give administrative advice and um, administrative recommendation and administrative order and emergency order. Um, these uh, arrowheads are ordered in order of the uh, from the loser um, loser disposition to stricter disposition. So uh, if this commission um, orders administri administrative order and the data subject does not obey the order, and then uh, sometimes imprisonment up to six months or a fine up to 300,000 yen could be um, imposed as punishment. And as a direct enforcement by commission, the commission may in, uh, impose uh, imprisonment for up to one year or a fine of up to 500,000 yen for data theft or for providing the data for illicit gain or wrongful uh, conduct. And this can be applied extraterritorial. So as long as the data, uh, personal data is uh, from Japan and the, uh, the data related to the services for Japan, um, the person who breached, who violated the law uh, can face 
this extraterritorial punishment. If the disclosing party is a real entity, um, this uh, penalty can be um, imposed to both the person in the legal entity and the legal entity itself. And the legal entity is only punished uh, by a fine because it is impossible to, to confine legal entity into a prison. Also, um, if, if personal uh, data uh, is reached and um, the law is violated, probably uh, victims may raise uh, damage claims pursuant to civil law. And also, uh, it is commonly um, publicized by mass media and the data subjects, uh, sorry, data uh, processor will face a uh, loss of credibility and damages its reputation. Now let me introduce the past uh, cases uh, which the data processor um, leaked personal information to third party. Uh, first one is TBC case. Uh, this is a, an aesthetic company and they uh, just leaked uh, like address, name and um, um, email addresses. And they, um, they were uh, ordered to pay 30,000 yen per person uh, by the court. And the second one is Mitsubishi UFJ Securities case. Um, this is a financial company, and they paid 10,000 yen voluntarily. And the third case is um, Uji City case. Uh, this is a, a local government in Japan, and they leaked um, their uh, the residents' uh, address, names, and uh, birth dates. And the court ordered Uji City to pay 10,000 yen. And the last two cases are uh, the uh, data uh, breach case, but the uh, number here, presented here, is so small. This is because um, this is uh, the, the the amount given here is the the amount the companies voluntarily paid to each person. Uh, for Benetta case, um, this is an educational industry. In, in this, it's educational industry, and they have some uh, prep schools. And the data breached was children's data, and among the data, um, some sensitive data was included, such as the mother's uh, delivery date, because they wanted to um, reserve for their baby to come position in prep school. So uh, actually, the um, damage admitted by the court varies among the data, data subjects. And some of the data subjects uh, filed lawsuits, and some of the cases are still pending. And 500 yen is paid by Benesic Corporation voluntarily, but this is the payment per person. So um, actually, the victims amounted to 35 million persons. So as a to uh, so 35 million persons. So the, as a total, the damage was so huge. And the last case is Yahoo BB case. And Yahoo BB is a service name, and this is a service internet connection service provided by SoftBank BB, and they voluntarily paid 500 yen per person, but um, SoftBank BB's um, affiliate BB Technology and Yahoo BB were sued by uh, some of the victims, and they they were ordered to pay uh, 5,500 Japanese yen to each de uh, defendant by Osaka High Court. And the, um, also in this case, the victims amounted to 4.5 million persons. So the payment, uh, finally, uh, Yahoo BB pet was so huge. So uh, this is all uh, we, uh, we we explained. Yes, I think we we just uh, covered the, the most important parts of um, the. the
APPR uh, in, the, in, in Japan and the uh, APPI application to give you really a, a short overview. And now um, uh, we are still here for, for questions. And I think there was uh, one question uh, already um, uh, to what extent uh, the, the fines uh, that are mentioned here are uh, per, per data subject. Um, so maybe if we, if we uh, can go back to the slide uh, before, um, let me see here, um, you see the um, commission uh, can basically uh, enforce and impose a fine. And this fine, the maximum fine, in fact, for data theft and wrongful doing is 500,000 yen. So this is relatively small if you consider the uh, fines under the GDPR that can go up to 4% of the worldwide turnover of, of uh, a business um, processing the data or 20 million euro, whichever is, is higher, basically. So in Japan, typically, a monetary fine is not um, uh, so high compared to other regions in, in the world. In Japan, typically, the most um, severe punishment uh, to companies is the loss of uh, reputation in, in the market because most, most companies or most users would not use this type of service anymore. Yeah. And uh, uh, going back to the, the last slide we had here, <clears throat> those um, fines, in this case not fines, in this case damages that have been awarded by a court or amounts that have been um, agreed upon in a settlement agreement like in those uh, last cases, uh, uh, Benes case and uh, Yahoo BB case uh, are in fact um, damage compensation amount uh, per data set, so to say, so basically per data subject individually. And in the last two cases, uh, what, what is special here is that a, a lot of uh, persons were basically concerned. So in the case of Benes, it's 35 million persons. So the 500 yen for the individual um, whose data had been misused is in fact not much, yes, um, but for the company, taking into consideration that 35 million persons were concerned, it's still a high economic risk. Um, thank you, uh, Ulrich, and uh, thank you for the uh, presentation. Thank you, Edison, for the presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that you <laughs> took the first question by yourself. Uh, I don't know if there are other questions popping out. Otherwise, I do have a question myself. So probably maybe uh, I would give a couple of minutes to the audience to think about uh, any potential questions for you um, in Edison and uh, I, can, uh, I can start with mine. So I, I saw in these last couple of slides you were mentioning the different kind of violations and sanctions for, for those violations and you also mentioned um, something about the GDPR and the percentage of the, of the revenues. Uh, are there, I know that there are a lot of different roles uh, within the regulation, but how would you, can you, would you be able to uh, compare uh, the, the main differences between the two systems in terms of uh, sanctions? Um, yes, well, going, going back here to the overview uh, on, the, on the Japanese uh, sanctions, what is, what is very important uh, to note in Japan, before it comes to the imposement of any fine, um, the authorities would use any measures they have from the administrative side to basically guide the company where the data breach um, occurred uh, to basically avoid this kind of um, data breach in the future. So before the uh, a fine is imposed, they would follow um, the, the order of the administrative measures they can take that are listed here, up here in this, in this slide. So let me show that uh, to, to you here. Yeah, those are basically uh, the, the measures that can be taken. So basically, um, they would uh, first ask for a report. Um, to be filed, then they would give some guidance in, in the form of uh, advice. Um, if they see the need that it has to go beyond the advice, they may give a recommendation what to do better in the future. And only if they realize 
that the, the company is basically not following that they would uh, uh, give an administrative order. So, and then if the administrative order is also not complied with, so they would monitor this with this company, um, they would come uh, uh, most likely to the conclusion that they have to take more severe measures, which would in, in most cases then um, be that they impose a fine on the company. But this is a really, um, really last resort, so to say, in, in most uh, cases in Japan. Um, that's essentially called the so -called, uh, soft lending approach um, in, in Japan. So, so the administration would rather um, try to convince the companies uh, to avoid it in the future through guidance than through severe fines. Um, on the other hand, as I mentioned earlier, for the company, um, the, the most severe punishment um, would be uh, from the customer side. Uh, since in, in Japan, customers, uh, as I mentioned, would usually not use the service anymore. Um, if you look at it from a, from a European perspective or GDPR perspective, um, of course, uh, in, uh, the GDPR also follows um, a similar structure in the sense that um, the fines that are mentioned are uh, severe. Uh, they bring basically data protection uh, to a, a complete different level, comparable, for example, to uh, antitrust uh, violations, um, and um, which also make this this topic of data protection a boardroom topic of very high uh, in importance. But also under the GDPR, and there uh, exist, uh, of course, other measures than imposing a fine. So before a fine is imposed also in the EU, usually the um, authorities would, would take uh, first other steps such as um, uh, administrative orders um, to order the, the company at issue to take measures to avoid the breach in the future. Uh, take internal measures, technical measures, legal measures, etc. cetera. Um, and if the company again violates in the future, um, uh, of course, uh, fines may be, may be imposed. But you know, how this um, um, punishment system is, um, is used is, uh, to a certain extent, of course, at the discretion of the authorities then imposing um, those uh, fines. Yeah? But uh, in, typically uh, in the EU, um, the, the punishment is, is stricter and more um, driven by fines that, that are imposed uh, in case of non-compliance. Thank you, Oregar. You have been really, really clear. Um, I, the, in the meantime, I don't see any further questions uh, here in the chat box. So we're super on time. Uh, I would like to thank uh, both of the speakers, Ulrich and Erisan, for for today, uh, you've been extremely helpful, and uh, uh, the conversation has been uh, fruitful and very educational. So, if you agree, and also this is for the benefit of the participants, we will uh, upload as usual the the final version of the presentation as a PDF on the on the website of the help desk. Uh, so, just give us a couple of days. We need to process edit the file. And, uh, and the video, and you will also have the video on our YouTube channel, and you can rewatch it or you can share it with friends and colleagues. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, I would like to thank everyone again, the speakers, Eva from Brussels for the help as usual, and uh, you, the participants, of course. We will meet again at the end of October uh, for the next webinar. So, thanks much to everyone, and have a, a wonderful weekend. Yeah, thank you very much, Thank you Luka. very much. Thank, thank you, you Eva.